And now uh, another guy who can make me teary-eyed with laughter <laughs> is coming up here. My uh, comrade brother, Mike Klonsky, who I bonded with in the old Soviet Union while we were playing baseball with Athletes United for Peace. And he's a great educator and an, an analysis of education. And um, good morning to you, Mike Klonsky. Hey, good morning to you, Mike and Katie. Good morning, it's Mike. Honor to be here on your 35th anniversary. Congratulations to you. Thank you, dear. It's hard to believe I, it is. it's been that long, huh? It, it is. In addition to all the things that Michael just claimed you are, you are one heck of a great family man, and I just want to give a shout out to Susan and your beautiful daughters that you guys have done a great, oh. great work. And I like your brother, too, and his, yes. his wife like and brother. their kids. That's true. You're part of a great you clan. Know, uh, <laughs> one of my greatest memories of the Heartland Cafe was uh, that we celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary here. Mm. Oh, nice. I remember that. It was a, I remember. a wonderful night. How long ago was that? That was uh, 13 years ago. Wow. Yeah. So, wow. Wow. That's terrific. I'm glad. And I'm with you. How can it be so long and we're so young? Exactly. Good looking, you know? Exactly. Yeah. I don't Speaking know. Speaking of good looking, how are the looks of education in America ah, these good, days? Good well, segue, That was Mike. the worst segue I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly the well, worst. I see you got diverse opinions on this show. You got one guy liking it, one woman not liking it. So we, uh, if there's any critics or people claiming we only represent one side, now you got it. We are for everybody. You know, I, I, I just came back from... Uh, I just came back from Washington, D.C., uh, where we had a, uh, a march uh, on the ellipse outside the White House. 5,000 teachers, mainly teachers, uh, came and expressed their anger about what's going on right now. We also had uh, three days of conferencing to try to build something new uh, called Save Our Schools. Uh, that, was the, that was the slogan of the march, and it was about just what it says, trying to save public education because public education right now is under the the worst assault that I've seen in, in all my lifetime. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Is it true that Rick Perry really wants to just get rid of public education altogether in Texas? Who cares what Rick Perry thinks? Well, I'm just asking oh, I'm a question. Sorry. Well, he's actually doing it. I mean, uh, he is, you know, he, in his state, slashing the uh, education budget to bits, uh, firing teachers in mass, uh, replacing public schools with privately uh, run charter schools and uh, doing all this uh, in order to uh, give tax breaks to the big oil companies, you know, that are, you know, uh, thriving in Texas with, 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 with uh, hardly paying any taxes. What's it look like uh, here in Chicago and Illinois? I mean, we have uh, in today's Sun-Times that says teacher union chief predicts strike vote, but not a strike. Uh, we know that um, uh, the new mayor, uh, Rahm Emanuel, is uh, now getting people to, ready to go to the mats to, uh, to bring about cuts on many fronts, uh, challenging yeah. union leaders. What's your take on well, all this, see, Mike the irony Ronsky? is that uh, people think that it's just the uh, Tea Party governors like Perry or like uh, yeah. Walker up in Wisconsin, and there's been a big reaction to, to what they've been doing, their union busting and their uh, anti-public school policies. But we, we've got pretty much the same thing going on here in Illinois and in Chicago. Uh, the, it, here, it, it's worse in some ways because the mayor actually controls the schools. The mayor runs the schools, and so the public school system has become a wing of City Hall almost. And you know what that entails in terms of corruption and, and things like that. And not a lot of education. And not a lot of education. So uh, what we've seen is a, this assault on teachers continue. You know, that, that's the thing that's gotten so many teachers pissed off because they've been so debased and so degraded and not getting the respect that teachers deserve. So uh, now they've, they've laid off 1,500 uh, workers here in Chicago, 1,500 teachers here in Chicago. They've slashed the uh, education budget by around $85 million. And so we're seeing the same kind of things here in Chicago with the uh, a democratic leadership, as we've seen in the in the Tea Party states in Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin, and places like that. Well, Mike, let me ask you this: um, Have any of those cuts of the 1,500 teachers here in Chicago uh, been taken away from the, the elite uh, college prep uh, high schools, or some of the options or uh, magnet school programs, or do those schools, uh, which have been good, and we would certainly like them to be have schools like that for everyone, uh, but are they getting any preferential? You know, I think, there's, I think there's cuts across the across board. The I mean, board. I've got teachers who are friends of mine at some of the schools that you're talking about. I, one teacher in particular who's got nearly uh, 30 years in the system getting ready to retire, and she got a, a letter in her mailbox saying, don't bother to report uh, for school uh, next week, or, you know, in September. 
and uh, they say you, they told her that she has been um, redefined. They have this new thing called redefinition, where they can't fire tenured teachers, but what they do is redefine their position. And so the, if you're an art teacher, they say, well, we've closed the art position, but we've hired a young teacher who's a graphic To do something graphic like art. art. Something like that, yes. <laughs> teach uh -huh. something like art. Wow. And it's a, you know, I've never seen anything like this. And they're com completely violating the union contract. They lied about the budget uh, in, in order to cut the 4% the, uh, pay raise that uh, teachers won in the last contract negotiations. And so there's an assault going on, not just against teachers, but against their unions as well. And it's part of the overall, uh, well, the climate in the country is, is, is turning very strongly against unions. Where do, you, where do you think that climate is uh, on the ascendancy? Oh, uh, we had a, a situation in Wisconsin where certainly the masses turned out uh, unions and their supporters, teachers, people probably who even voted for Walker. Uh, and then they've had these series of recall elections and uh, the Democrats got two uh, seats back from the Republicans in the state Senate. Uh, and those are Republican districts. Uh, but I'm wondering if uh, you know we didn't get enough up there, or there weren't enough to to change the situation to have the recall and get control of the Senate. Uh, where do you think it's going? Yeah. Well, to me, there's that's a hopeful sign. The struggle that went on, the pushback, the recall movement up there, and the Save Our Schools movement are hopeful signs that there's uh, resistance. You know, where there's oppression, there's always resistance. But there in Wisconsin, they're up against powerful. Uh, forces, reactionary uh, forces, conservative forces who poured millions and millions of dollars into the state. People like uh, the Koch brothers, the DeVos family, uh, these billion, uh, right wing billionaires uh, are, are really a formidable opponent to a public education and everything that everything that's public. Mike, yeah. what, I think it's more complicated than, I mean, I know it's more complicated than anything the paper uh, chooses to uh, elucidate us, uh, to elucidate on. Elucidate and, on. Is that a yeah, word? <laughs> yeah, it is. Elucidate. I'll spell it. But anyway, the, um, the formula for Chicago schools is uh, so uh, backward and unfair. Uh, we've yes. got it based on the property tax. Yes. That's, that's what funds our schools, which means that people in Naperville get great schools that's and right. people on the west side hardly get schools at all. And that, that gap, that gap that can be, if you pull, pull the camera back and look at the entire nation, that gap between the haves and have nots is to me the scariest tendency of our times. And how do we address that and get past the uh, rather pointless name calling and finger pointing between the quote unquote two sides? I'm sorry, there are more than two sides to all of these issues. And just because the Tea Party wants to make it so, doesn't make it so. No, you're absolutely right, Katie. You know, uh, one of the big arguments uh, for privatizing schools now is that our public education system trails the rest of the world. Right. But the fact is that if they would, if they would break out the scores of our rich, wealthy communities and compare them to any place in the world, we would be uh, right up there among the top. And our poorest schools, the schools in the poorest communities, are probably well below uh, many of uh, many countries in the third world. Right. And so. Uh, it shows that the problem isn't with the way we, the way we, with our teachers or the way we educate, but it's a, a big gap in the kind of resources and supports that different communities get, and it's, uh, you know, uh, so that's that's the fundamental issue of our time. Uh, it, it's not a matter of quote school reform; it's a matter of social reform. Social reform. Uh, you know, we have uh, we have the second highest uh, child poverty rate in the world. Uh, we have the highest rate of incarceration in the world. In the world. I mean, when you look at statistics like that, you know, you can see how they might reflect on how kids are doing in school. Footnote on the uh, incarceration rate. There's an article in the New York Times this morning about uh, how conservative states, including Texas, are... Uh, letting people out of prison early because for financial reasons, you know, not that they uh, would be questioned the way uh, prisons shape people's lives, but they are cutting back on prison population based on finances. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, well, indeed. Yeah. They go both ways. Ten they years do. ago, it was a community <laughs> no. development tool to I build a prison in your community. And now, the other, and the other thing they will do is uh, privatize the prison system even further, right. especially the juvenile uh, detention centers. Speaking of privatization, uh, can you just give a, a quick description of what a charter school is? And uh, then my question is, uh, do pri charter schools actually produce... Uh, kids with better education or not? I thought I read something recently that said they really don't do any better than public schools. Well, because uh, charter schools, uh, uh, because the way they measure those things is strictly on the basis of standardized testing. And as we know, uh, stand standardized test results uh, are uh, vary on the basis of, primarily on the, the uh, economic situation of the parents. So if you look at parents' income tax returns, you can, their te the test scores of their children is very predictable. Hmm. As for charter schools, they originally were created as public schools to be uh, kind of centers of innovation. And uh, we helped start as, you know, you know, I've been the head of the I small know, you schools were into workshop. It for a while there. Yeah, we helped start the first charter schools here in Chicago. And at that time, they were teacher-led teacher-run schools, kind of experimental schools where new innovations could be practiced, and if they, were, if they worked, they could be spread to the rest of the school district. But what happened about a decade ago is that the charter school movement was kind of co-opted, taken over by uh, corporate interests, and now there are mainly schools that are being run by private operating companies, not by teachers. In fact, teachers in private schools have m less autonomy and less uh, uh, authority than they did when, when they, they in, started. When they started. Don't, don't teachers no. in charter schools also not have to uh, be teachers, actually? I mean, isn't there a part of Well, they're, not, they're not required to be certified right. in the same way that uh, regular, public schools, te regular public school teachers Require. are. And mm -hmm. as a result, charter schools can hire teachers at a lower rate of pay. They're, they're, not, allowed to have the, they're not allowed to belong to the same union bargaining uh, unit as public school teachers are by law. Really? So in a way, they're part of the same kind of union busting uh, uh, ethos. We have a situation in this areas. community. There is a uh, charter school up on Clark Street, and uh, the teachers in that school voted to right. have a union. And I guess the NLRB, National Labor Relations Board, approved that. But there's still a battle going on about there's it. What do you know about that? It's just like uh, organizing the unorganized in any field. It's going to be a battle. And the, uh, these companies that run the charter schools are going to do everything they can to uh, decertify unions, to stop a, a union election from taking place, just like in every other industry. You know, that same struggle is going on. Now, as to the question of results, all the studies show now that uh, charter schools, about 17% of them are doing better than the regular public schools that you find in the neighborhoods. But that's not a very high percentage. Not very high. high. So the overwhelming majority are doing about the same or worse than the public schools that they were intended to replace. But they are a great marketing tool for selling property in neighborhoods, uh, like for, you know, for the new gentry hmm. that are, uh, you know, that don't want to send their kids to private schools. And so, I mean, the public school. schools. And so that's, I think that's really what it's about. Uh, uh, it's, it's really a real estate issue more than an educational issue. My Michael Klonsky, I, uh, there's a new uh, superintendent of public schools here in Chicago, and he yep. came out of Rochester, yes, and there's did. some controversy, and I'd like to know, get your take on him and his policies, and then I would like to extend that to Arne Duncan and his policies, and then I'd like to extend it even more to why Obama backs Barney Duncan. So if you keep track Ooh. of the questions, um, we'll, <laughs> One just, at a time. we'll just listen. Well... Uh, uh, J.C. Brazard, as you pointed out, was the superintendent in Rochester. Uh, when he first came in, uh, he was welcomed, really, by the teachers. He sounded like a progressive guy. He had a good track record in New York City. And he was an educator, which these days is rare to have a superintendent who's actually an educator. Usually, they're Arne Duncan or Paul Vallis types who are either you know, bureaucrats or Vallis. I think he was a bag man for or the mayor. <laughs> or basketball players. Or basketball players. But, but uh, uh, Broussard was actually an educator. And when he came in, he seemed pretty good. By the time uh, two, two years went by, and it turned out that he was... He was uh, uh, of the same mode as uh, what we have now. Uh, that is, uh, he was a, really a hatchet man, uh, brought in to fire teachers, close schools, 
and to uh, implement uh, this kind of test-based accountability system, you know, which is, has been a disaster under No Child Left Behind. So, uh, by the, by the, after two years, uh, he ended up in a situation where 95% of the teachers in Rochester voted uh, a no confidence vote. And that was one of the main reasons why he had to leave. And oh, of course, swell. that was just the kind of guy that, uh, that our doing, mayor how, wanted to bring how's here. He, yeah. How's he doing here? Well, pretty much the same thing. It's too early to really uh, uh, praise or condemn him. But don't forget, here, he's really an arm of, the, of City Hall. It's not like, a, it's not a matter of what will Brazard do. It's a matter of what will Rahm Emanuel tell Brazard to do. And that's a problem of mayoral control of the school. So he really has no independent role, uh, independent voice. When he first came in, Rahm Emanuel told him he couldn't talk to the press for the first uh, month he was here. It's not a bad idea, imagine, actually. Uh, can you imagine a, a, a guy in charge of the schools being told by the mayor, you can't speak to the press, and it just showed this guy really has no power independently of the mayor. All right, the next question was about Arne Duncan. Arne Duncan. And national policy on schools. Yeah, Arne Duncan, uh, you know, is a guy I, I really had high hopes for. You know, I knew him when he was here in Chicago. Uh, turns out, uh, you know, uh, he, he, might be, he might be, at least in my mind, the worst... Secretary of Education in history. Yeah, uh, he's completely capitulated to the Tea Party line on schools. He's uh, he's came out when they when they fired teachers in mass in a in a town in Rhode Island uh, uh, because they had, had low test scores. When they fired every every teacher, the staff, the the food staff, the maintenance people. Duncan came out the next day and praised it, called it an act of courage, you know. And uh, since th that set the pattern for what's going on now, uh, 100,000 teachers losing their jobs, uh, uh, a new policy called Race to the Top, which just by its name, you can tell what that's about. Uh, winners and losers in the public school system. Um, yeah, that's good. Yeah. And uh, now, uh, that No Child Left Behind has been so discredited, Arne Duncan says he's going to give waivers to uh, school districts, uh, not to count their test scores, provided that they follow this race to the top policy of school closings, teacher firings, and replacing public schools with charter schools, and even more testing madness than they had under No Child Left Behind. Only this time, it's it's kind of a, a autocratic move. Uh, sidestepping Congress and taking all the power into his own hands, you know, and, but that, he's not going to uh, be able to pull that off. There's going to be so much resistance to that, and the march we had in Washington is really just the beginning. Yeah, tell us about Save Our Schools, and, and, and only because we only have a couple more minutes, um, Good. What, but you can come back. What the, hope, <laughs> what the hopeful uh, places are, in your mind, as far as uh, the school the future for public education. Here. Well, the march got so, people so excited around the country that they agreed to go back to their home districts and cities all across the country and start uh, Save Our Schools groups. Committees. Mm -hmm. Committees of teachers, parents, students, uh, community activists in every city. So, you know, I kind of took that seriously and uh, we've started, you know, we've just begun to gather people together. Uh, begin meetings here in the city, uh, pulling together people from uh, the region, from Milwaukee, Rockford area, Chicago, and we're going to have our first uh, Save Our Schools meeting. So people who want to get in on this on the ground floor and have a say in how it's shaped and formed, uh, they should uh, contact us. We set up, a, in fact, yesterday, we set up a Facebook group called SOS Chicago, and people can contact us through their uh, teachers especially, but also parents, uh, anybody who's, who's angry and wants to make change in the school system. And, uh, you know, we, we welcome them. And uh, we hope to hear from uh, How would listeners. they contact you or, or these uh, or SOS? Well, that's what I say. The best way on the Facebook is page? to go on Facebook, SOS Chicago, and sign up. You know, and then we'll contact you about when our first uh, meetings are going to be, what kind of actions we're going to have. We're going to have some protest actions. We're going to uh, form coalitions with other, uh, with the unions, with other public education reform groups in the city that are willing, and hopefully we'll be able to have an impact. Instead of just, you know, the problem since, really since Obama was elected, is that those of us who supported Obama, and supported Arne Duncan for that matter, 
we've, we, we, uh, we've turned politics into a spectator sport. And we sit back and we, we hope that Obama will do the right thing. And we hope that Arne Duncan will do the right thing. We hope that Rahm Emanuel will do the right thing. But we, and then we read in the paper and hope, oh, it's like watching the ball scores almost, you know, yep. and rooting for the Cubs. Uh, uh, politics can't be like that. Never, never, never did have, that. No. Never did that. We've got to be engaged. Don't know what that feels yeah, like. We've got to be engaged and make change like we, you all have been doing for uh, more than 35 years here in the city. Well, I like the new SOS, Save Our Schools. I, I'll have to change in my mind, Stop Our Ships, Save Our Sailors, left over from the Vietnam well, just think, War. Just think, <laughs> just think SDS without the, SOS. Oh, without the D. Yeah. It's Save time for school. us to say thank you, Michael, All even right. though that says 59. It's well, okay, we want to thank everybody who tuned in to guys. listen to another edition of Live from the Harlem. We want to thank Mike Klonsky for Let's coming on Let's hear from Mike Klonsky and his wife.